With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Uh, it's Heard Tell. It's Monday again, folks. Let's get back after it and get some good things done in the world. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us on Herd Tell, giving us the most precious thing you have, your time. We don't want to waste it. We've got some important stuff to talk to you about today. We're going to turn down the noise and go deep overseas. Our UK friends, they're down to the final two in the Conservative Party. Who's going to lead the party and by de facto be the next prime minister? Our good friend Lettuce Borowski from over there is going to join us from England. We're going to go deep. The two leading candidates, who are they? What are they about? What do we think they might do if they get into office? We're also going to talk about the also-rans because there is some important movement within that party who might be the future, who might be losing power, who obviously had power behind the scenes that we didn't know ahead of time. Good deep dive on the UK elections for the next conservative leader and the next prime minister with our friend Lettuce Borowski over in England. Also, we always end on a good note. This once again, J.J. Watt is an amazing human being, this time taking care of funeral expenses for a family in Houston. We'll talk about that to end the program. But first, um, I want to talk about something that's used. It's it's passed into lore, and sometimes when things become mythologized, we lose the actual context of them. Uh, you know, we talk about turning down the noise of the news cycle. We talk about not caterwauling, not yelling. We want to be efficient and not just uh, you know, loud. We want to be effective. We want to get things done that matter. Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena speech gets used a lot online. Um, and it gets a lot of credit for one of the real famous parts of the beginning where it talks about, it's not the critic that counts. It's the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or the doers of deeds that could have done better. No, it's the man that's in the arena who spends himself on a worthy cause, who tries and fails and blah, 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 blah. You know, the story the bloody beaten man in the arena with the crowd of people who won't get in the arena. And that man is to be praised. And he is among the free peoples who govern themselves. Teddy Roosevelt said there is but a small field of usefulness open for the men of cloistered life who shrink from contact with their fellows. Oh, people love this part of the speech. It's the man in the arena. Everybody wants to be the man in the arena. They're the one person fighting and fighting and fighting. Problem is that whole speech is called citizen of the Republic. It was actually given to a French audience in Paris. Um, and the portion that everybody quotes about the man in the arena is towards the beginning of the speech. And if you know anything at all about TR, he was rather long-winded. He gave really, really, really long speeches. And this is a really, really long speech. But it's also an exceptional speech. That man in the arena part fighting that everybody wants to talk about was at the beginning of the speech. But he goes on through the rest of the speech to qualify it. Why the man in the arena should fight who he should fight, what they should do because they're citizens in a republic. They're not just that one individual, but the one individual part trends a lot more on social media because everybody thinks them and their social media account is the man in the arena and everybody else is wrong, right? Let's be honest. That's how you want to see yourself. But let's go to the end of that speech, kind of towards the end. Quoting TR here, there have been many republics in the past, both in what we call antiquity and what we call the Middle Ages. They fell. And the prime factor in their fall was the fact that the parties tended to divide along the lines that separate the wealth from the poverty. It made no difference which side was successful. It made no difference whether the republic fell under the rule of an oligarchy or the rule of a mob. In either case, when once loyalty to a class had been substituted for loyalty to the republic, the end of the republic was at hand. There's no greater need day to day than the need to keep ever in mind the fact that the cleavage between right and wrong, between good citizenship and bad citizenship, runs at right angles to, not parallel with, the lines of cleavage between class and class, between occupation and occupation. Ruin looks us in the face if we judge a man by his position instead of judging him by his conduct in that position. In a republic, to be successful, we must learn to combine intensity of conviction. The man in the arena, right? Bloody, fighting, striving, failing. TR said this, we must learn to combine intensity of conviction with a broad tolerance of difference of conviction. Why differences of opinion in matters of religious, political, and social belief must exist if conscious and intellect alike are not to be stunted, if there's to be room for healthy growth. 
bitter internecine hatreds based on such differences and signs not of in earnestness of belief but of fanaticism which whether religious or anti-religious democratic or anti-democratic is itself but a manifestation of the gloomy bigotry which has been the chief factor in the downfall of so many many nations of one man in a special beyond anyone else the citizen of a republic should be aware and that is the man who appeals to them to support him on the grounds that he is hostile to the other citizens of the Republic, that he will secure for those who elect him in one shape or another profit at the expense of the other citizens of the Republic. It makes no difference whether he appeals to class hatred or class interest, to religious or anti-religious prejudice. The man who makes such an appeal always should always be presumed to make it for the sake of furthering his own interests. The very last thing an intelligent and self-respecting member of a democratic community should do is to reward any public man because that public man says he will get that private citizen something to which that citizen is not entitled or gratify some emotion or animosity which this private citizen ought not to possess. That's later on in the speech. Between those two points is a lot of good stuff you should go read for yourself. We'll link to it in the notes. Talks about what kind of people we should be, what kind of citizens we should be. Talks about the wealthy class, the lower classes. Talks about religious and anti-religious animosity. Talks about democratic and undemocratic things. But it all goes back to that. I'm going to repeat this line because it's vastly missing in our society right now, especially our American society. I don't think America is going to fall anytime soon, but we do have troubles and they need to be dealt with. Where does all that trouble come? What's the fountainhead to all that bad news that we doom scroll on our social media and the talking heads relentlessly pound at us from their network news stations? This is the key right here. In a republic, we must be successful to learn to combine intensity of conviction with a broad tolerance of difference of conviction. You better love your freedom and your liberty, and you better love your principles. You better love them enough to make sure everybody else has the freedom and liberty to live their principles out as well. That's the trick to making America work right. That would make America great. But that requires a little bit of individual greatness from all of us to give a little bit more to our fellow citizens. We'll do more her teller after this. Welcome back to Hurtel. Okay, been excited about this one for a while. We've been wanting to talk to her for a while. She is one of the outstanding Young Voices contributor in the UK side of the stable, and we are thrilled to have her on. She's a political commentary. She is a frequent guest over yonder. We're thrilled to have her right here with us, Lettuce Borkowski, today. How are you, ma'am? Hi, I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on. Ramofsky. I said it wrong, but we, they're used to, yeah, yeah, don't right. worry. Let, I got the lettuce right and the Bermoski wrong, but we're so yeah. thrilled to have you. Um, we're going to kind of deep dive this, this prime minister race a little bit. We've been covering it as it's developed, but I think it's important to get the overall picture here. So before we zoom into what's actually happening, just big picture wise, um, how did we get here? Kind of start, um, since Rishi Sunak is now one of the final two, we can say, Really, it was him and, and Savid's resignations that kicked all this off. You can talk a little bit about the scandal that was the, the one scandal too far and a long list of controversial things. Yeah. <laughs> Just take us back to that, because that's when the ball really got rolling on this. Then a couple of days later, Boris finally relented. Let's start there as background and kind of a framework here. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Happy to. So although here in the UK, it feels like this has quite literally been going on for months, maybe even years. This all only started really back at the start of July um, with yet another scandal that arose um, when the deputy chief whip, Christopher Pincher, was actually accused of sexually assaulting two men whilst at a private conservative members club in London. Boris did sort of what Boris does best and he came out 
um, defended this man, which mainly we put down to because Mr. Pincher was a devout Boris loyalist from back in January um, when Boris was facing off another rebellion. So Boris comes out, he defends him, saying sort of, I didn't know anything about um, Mr. Pincher's kind of wandering hands. I didn't know anything about his habits. However, very quickly after that, I would say two days, we found out this was entirely untrue. Boris himself had in fact been briefed um, on Chris Pincher's kind of ways, and yet he had looked the other way. So Boris had just come out and lied outright to everyone. And this was kind of the straw that you could say that broke the camel's back. Um, and after that, as you were just saying, we saw the resignations of Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid in one sort of foul swoop on the Tuesday. Um, and then what can kind of only be called uh, or described as kind of death by a thousand paper cuts, as we saw 60 ministerial uh, like MPs and people in other ministerial positions resigning from their jobs until essentially Boris had no choice but to resign himself. Um, although he did this in a very Boris fashion, his resignation speech, which finally happened on the Thursday, he he never apologised for anything that had happened. There was no sort of contrition there. Um, but more than that, he never actually said the word resign in his so-called resignation speech. Um, and so this was uh, this was sort of what kick started where we are now with our, our leadership campaign. Yeah. And to be clear, because we're dealing with a parliamentary system, which the American audience and some of the worldwide audience may not be familiar with, uh, the party is still in power. So whoever leads the party yes. will de facto become the prime minister. Uh, Y'all had a because of the way the system set up, because of things that happened prior. Nobody really wants to have another general election for a while if they can help it, although I'm sure Labor would love to have one tomorrow if they yeah. could do it. <laughs> This this is going to go for a little while. Just talk about the system of governments here, because it seems weird, maybe to the American audience is like, what do you mean they're picking the prime minister? Well, because the party's still in power. Boris said it ad nauseum the last couple of weeks. He brought in this massive 80 some seat majority to parliament. Yeah. So the party's still in power and the leader of the party is going to become prime minister. Just kind of break that down for us. Yeah, so as you say, when a prime minister resigns here in the UK, it doesn't mean that the party is forced to have a general election. In fact, almost the opposite. The party stays the same. The government, sorry, stays the same. Um, and as you said, Boris won this incredible 2019 mandate. He won many of the red wall seats, which red wall seats in the UK are essentially what have been Labour stronghold seats for a very long time. Yeah, like and our swing voter districts in the America. Yeah. OK, exactly. Um, and so now the, the party will stay in power. But that is also has a few downsides, as it means that right now we have an almost zombie type government as well. Now, just Rishi and Liz are battling it out over the next month um, to win leadership, which will take place on the 5th of September. Um, and then they will be leader. But until that moment, Boris is remaining in his position as a sort of caretaker, as it's been described. Um, with a sort of zombie government where the focus isn't really on uh, the necessary things that it should be, perhaps. You know, we've got a huge cost of living crisis. We've got Ukraine going on. Um, but in terms of the leadership contest itself, um, exactly. The first few rounds that we've just had, which saw, um, I believe, five or maybe four um, other candidates eliminated, the only people who can vote in that are the MPs themselves. So it's a very small collection. And now as we move to this final round, voting has been opened up to a wider um, Conservative Party membership, which here in the UK is around uh, between sort of it's unknown the exact numbers, but about 160,000 people to 200,000 people. As a very small percentage of the actual electorate, about 0.5% of the entire UK electorate. So there's not many people who will actually be voting for the next prime minister. Um, but once they become prime minister, they will just take up the helm where Boris left um, and continue for the next you know, year and a half, two years until we have to have a general election. Yeah. Let us Romanski joining us. Let, let's just start right there as we dig into this contest, though, because the way they do it, like you said, this is just the MPs voting. Uh, you had to have mm -hmm. 20 MPs to be nominated. There's a lot of, you know, back backroom dealings and relationships and networks and these sorts of things. The narrative has been, 
Okay, well, the MPs are going to have their favorites. Um, Rishi basically went wire to wire for all. He was the favorite going in. He's he's the top vote winner on the other side of it. The narrative, though, is the MPs have their favorite. But when this goes to the wider party, a lot of people are saying that Liz or whoever was going to oppose him, it would probably invert and they would probably be the favorite again. Is that noise or do you see evidence that that's the case? No, we are seeing exactly evidence of that. And I think it's actually a really, really interesting differential between the different views that we're seeing here between MPs and the actual Conservative membership vote. So when Liz and Rishi went um, head to head in this final vote, they got Liz got 113 MPs to support her and Rishi got 137 MPs to support him. Um, so Rishi was very clearly the front runner, runner sorry, and Liz would have a, a bit of building up that she had to do. However, in polls that have been taken yesterday within the wider Conservative membership, Liz has an immediate 62% lead on Rishi for favourite to be the leader. And that's a huge swing that we've seen. Um, and we're not entirely sure what this is about, but one of the strangest things that we've seen, well, one of the strangest things I think that we've seen come out of this is this Boris ballot um, where people seem rather angry that Boris has been ousted. Um, and essentially they want him to come back. And around 6,000 Conservative membership um, voters have signed a petition saying that they want Boris back on the ballot. Um, and I'm not really sure how far ahead this is, um, but I think there's Liz, where she didn't resign um, from Boris's government, whereas Rishi, he did resign. And it was all rather a spectacle. And um, a day later, after his resignation, he came out with a video which showed he had clearly been planning this for weeks, if not months ahead, um, which I don't think has gone down very well with the membership itself. A video that, by the way, in English press got labeled as American styled for whatever reason. I yes. found that kind of interesting. <laughs> it was very American. <laughs> uh, well, he he was he. We'll get into his background in a minute. Hold that thought because he he's got some American tendencies and for good reason. He went to school here. We'll we'll get into that in a minute. We'll continue our conversation with our friend Lettuce from over in the UK. Her tale continues right after this. When you look at this race, though, what you just said, it's not a straight comparison to the left and right. The conservative party in England is not what we think of as American conservatives. They'd be well to the left of the, the midline conservatives in America. However, is it more accurate to, at this point to just call Boris Johnson a populist, especially when you see a poll number like that, that seems to be kind of divorced from the politics of the moment and you just kind of get a yeah. visceral reaction like that? Is it not just accurate to just kind of call him a populist at this point? Um, I mean, he definitely was. And that's something that Rishi is sort of trying to trying to get behind and do that kind of as well. He's trying to win over the voters. And when we look at it between Rishi and Liz, Liz very clearly struggles to be that same sort of schmoozer that Boris was. She doesn't seem at the moment, and this is probably one of her major downfalls, to be able to corral people and unite people in that same way. Whereas Rishi is very natural in front of a camera. He sort of thrives much more. Um, and so he'll sort of be waiting for that, um, in terms of the Conservative Party members, he'll be waiting for that big major moment. But Rishi, um, one of the main, although, as you say, sorry, they are both Conservative Party members and they do align on a lot of values. You know, they're both free marketeers and they support that. They're both supporting um, the immigration plan that we have at the moment for Rwanda, um, where it will see that any illegal immigrants crossing the channel will be able to be processed in Rwanda rather than here in the UK. Um, and obviously they both support um, Ukraine. Liz wants to actually increase defence spending to 3%. Um, but as you were saying, characteristically, they're very different. And what we're seeing now is one of the main, and actually I think the linchpin of the next few weeks is all around taxes. Rishi wants to 
um, continue with the tax hikes he has in plan. So increasing corporation tax from 19% to 25%, continuing with the rise in national insurance, uh, whereas Liz wants to cut taxes immediately, cut taxes to around 30, 30 billion in tax cuts. And that's where we're seeing the real divisiveness in the leadership right now. That's potentially where Rishi is losing a lot of like grassroots conservatives, um, whereas Liz is gaining them and winning them back a lot. Um, but that's the main divisive thing we're seeing at the moment. Is, is the cost of living crisis, where, and you can put taxes and inflation and food and fuel, all that falls under cost of living in the parlance that the media is mm-hmm. using over there. That's the issue, right? Everything else is slotted yeah. somewhere under that. Even within the conservative party, though, there seems to be a little bit of disagreement how to actually attack this. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And there are many MPs and um, members of the Conservative Party who do support Rishi's plan to um, basically hold off, save the economy first and tax uh, cut taxes later. Sorry. Um, but there are also uh, what we're seeing is that Rishi's had the past two years and we're predicted the UK to be the slowest growing economy in the G20 for this next year, only coming in above Russia which is an incredibly low bar. And that's the two years since 2019 that Rishi himself has presided over. Um, And I think one of the important things that we've got to look at is what's actually driving this inflation. And it's not because people are going out and they're spending loads of money and supply is, uh, demand, sorry, is booming. It's in fact because of huge supply chain issues that we're having in, um, because of things like Ukraine going on and the war in Ukraine. Um, which means that if we targeted the tax cuts and we cost them fully, uh, we should be able to not cause inflation at the same time as having these tax cuts. Yeah, some breaking news from our friend uh, Lettuce there. Uh, The UK is an island, and those supply chains kind of matters from history. Uh, We're talking to Lettuce. Spromowski, uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to get into a little bit of a deep dive. Rishi Sunak, Liz Trust, who are they? What are they? What are they about? We're going to get into that. We're also going to talk about some of these also rants because underneath the headliners, the party, there seems to be some interesting power moves that I think we can take away from this. We'll continue our conversation with our friend Lettuce from over in the UK. Her tale continues right after that. back to her tell we're overseas with our uk friends let us from from young voices she is a seasoned political commentator over there just go look at her young voices page she's all over the place over there it's amazing okay let's talk about these top two candidates uh they're both mps they're both well established uh let's start with rishi sunak he went wire to wire in the mp portion of this race he was the favorite he held the votes all the way through he's a young guy i believe he's what 42 years old uh, good looking guy. He, he comes from, um, Punjabi Hindu family, which of course is a big subset, uh, culturally in the UK. That'll be something folks want to talk about. Educated Oxford, of course, went to Stanford on a Fulbright, uh, Fulbright, excuse me, scholarship. So he has some American tendencies. He's wealthy. He's ambitious. He's obviously political, but who is Rishi Sunak? God, I mean, well, you covered him off pretty well there. He has for the last two years been the Chancellor of the Exchequer here. So he's been largely in charge of the economy. And to give him his dues, he's had to manage it during a particularly uh, difficult time, you could say, as we've been going through COVID. Um, And he has done that, well, to some extent, some people obviously criticised him for it, but he did well. He supported the economy. He uh, sent people on furlough during those two years. He did things like the eat out to help out scheme, essentially trying to support small businesses through these incredibly tough times. Um, But what we're seeing now is a sort of shift in that dynamic where I feel as we exited the COVID uh, pandemic, some will say it's not quite over 
yeah but I would say for me my mind at the start of this year life very much began to get back to normal we were um, going out eating out we were um, going back into work going back into the office life was just kind of opening back up and I think that he potentially missed an opportunity there to go back to real conservative values perhaps and instead in April when we had our um, financial budget released he chose to increase national insurance taxes um, and he said he would next year be increasing corporation tax. Um, For me I think this was a bad move particularly corporation tax as we're at a time when we want businesses to kind of be flocking to the UK to sort of have our post-Brexit post-Covid boom Um, And that's where I think he's slightly lost a beat on this. Um, But as you say, he is an incredibly intelligent man. He's very well educated in economics. Um, He's got himself into a little bit of a few scandals. I was interested in how you were picking up on his um, American Americanisms there. Um, There was a scandal and mainly one of his main ones. There have been two, I would say, was that um, he got into a scandal over his wife's non-dom status, which essentially meant that even though he was the chancellor of the exchequer, his wife was fully legally, I might add, um, avoiding taxes by remaining a non, uh, uh, not a citizen of the UK. Um, and so he got in quite a lot of hot water about that. He also has a green card, which when this came out, people were very unhappy about this, um, mainly because it felt almost like at any moment he would just leave the UK to become an American citizen and instead kind of turn his back on us. And it was very fraught at the time. Um, but other than that, um, he he is he has been the very clear front runner throughout this entire leadership contest. And I, I still do think it'll be quite close between him and Liz. Hey, we clipped off one of your princes. Now we're getting one of your PMs through. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> um, one quick little tidbit about him also, though, is you just mentioned it, though. Some of the little whispers you're getting now politically wise is, is he changing too much trying to craft a prime minister image from what he has been as an MP? Because people are starting to deem on that as like, OK, well, you're just you're adjusting just to become prime minister now. Is that going to hurt him going forward? No, because in many ways he will have to adjust because being Chancellor of the Exchequer, although being in one of those main positions within our government is the only way you can sort of practice to be Prime Minister. Um, And I think that's why a few of the other candidates fell off a little early is because you do need that experience. Being Prime Minister of this country is is a different job, though, and he will have to fashion himself in a sort of new light and in a new way, um, as that will just be shifting into a new role. Uh, one of the main concerns, though, of this is whether this um, this will lead to a lot of infighting within the Conservative Party. Um, it got to the point, we have a few televised debates here between the leadership candidates as they go. Um, and in fact, the last one ended up being cancelled because... Um, Rishi and Liz Truss pulled out because it was seen to be far too damaging to the party image. Um, And I think that is a very important point to touch on there that, um, and Liz actually said it in an interview recently, that even if Rishi wins, um, she, uh, even if she wins, sorry, she would hope to have Rishi within the fold of the Conservative Party. And that at the end of this, it'll all be about uniting the party together to continue on with all the financial difficulties and international difficulties that we have going on. Let's just go ahead and talk about Liz Trust then. Another young person, uh, she's not 50 yet. She's in her late 40s. Um, mm. Where do we start with her? Because here's the problem. Let's Let's just be grownups here. Any female MP that's looking to be the prime minister is going to get compared to Thatcher. She's already had to deal with this in the press. She actually had to come out and say, no, I'm not trying to dress like Thatcher, among (laughs) other silliness. That's going to be the comp. There's nothing. Theresa May dealt with this. She's going to deal with this. Whoever the next female of either party that's up for a prime minister, they're going to deal with it. What Mm, part of that's fair and what part of that's unfair? I think it's a very interesting point. And as you say, Liz came out and she said, um, there's always this sort of double standard that women are always compared to Thatcher and yet men are not necessarily always compared to Ted Heath, I think she said. Um, I think it's, you know, you never, we're not, 
we're not sort of looking for the next Thatcher. We want to be looking for the next great female leader. When that is Liz Truss, I think there's almost a sort of life has moved on a lot from them, though, although she does very much stand by Thatcher's principles. I think the direct comparison to her, which seems based purely a lot off because she's a female leader, is kind of unhelpful to her cause. I think Liz herself has done a huge, huge amount for this country. She's got the huge experience. She was justice secretary. She was trade secretary, where she did a, what I thought was most incredible work, pushing forward our new free trade deals, particularly with Japan and Australia when we were coming out of Brexit. Um, and it, she was sort of exemplar in getting those over the line. And then again, she's now recently just been foreign secretary. And she was very much there for Russia and Ukraine scandal. She was forceful with the sanctions. Um, and her policies, yes, they are thatch right in sort of essence, but they could also be equated to many other people, um, a bit like Reagan. They're very Reagan economics as well. So it goes it goes sort of both ways in this, I would say. We did it with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we did it with Rishi. Uh, Liz's background is very different from his. He kind of came in on top and went directly into high office. She really did climb the ladder. Of course, she went to Oxford as well. Her parents, though, her dad was a uh, was a university professor. Her mom was a nurse. That's important if you're going to hold, you know, healthcare things with the NHS issues, things like that. She's really climbed the ladder, even though she's still relatively young. You can just go look at her CV. Like she has held over yeah. a dozen different posts in government of various kinds. She's climbed the ladder. She's checked all the boxes. She's a career politician. I don't even mean that as a bad way. She just she's done all the work. Um, does that compare and contrast between her and Rishi matter in this race at all? Is there an experience over kind of the flashy new guy that came in and went not straight to the Exeter, but pretty much for all practical purposes compared to what she did? Is that a part of this race, too? Um, I would say that one of the main parts of this where that will be an effect is that, like you said, Rishi is a very high profile sort of politician. He and Boris have He's been in the news sort of every week, every day, sort of the front pages since he became in as chancellor. Um, but that, the only good thing that means for Liz Truss is that if Conservative Party members have made up their mind about him, it's unlikely that over the next month he'll be able to change that because he's been so public over these past few years, he's been entirely known. Whereas Liz Truss, she may not have been as public and she may not be as natural in front of a camera, but that plays to the other side of that. We've had Boris, who has been this great schmoozer, who has been basically very loose with his morals over the past two years, and that has played down to his other MPs. Um, and I think that could, in fact, play in her favour that she hasn't been caught up in party eight, the same as everyone else. Um, and she has sort of kept her head down and she's just can say that she has been working for the country and going forward. When her team was deflecting the Margaret Thatcher comparisons, um, they brought up uh, Ronald Reagan as well. Of course, those two are kind of linked in a lot of different ways. But they brought up a name as somebody that she did try to list as an influence, Nigel Lawson. For the American audience and for the international audience who doesn't know who Nigel Lawson is, why would she bring that up as, well, no, I'm not really trying to be Thatcher. I'm trying to be more like this person. That seems like an interesting name drop. Explain that for folks. So Nigel Lawson was a sort of big proponent of Thatcher's policies of uh, he, you know, Thatcher's policies in economics. He things like privatizing several key industries. Um, but one of the main things that he did was um, he saw the deregulation um, of the financial market, sort of halfway through her term, which essentially um, saw a huge boom within London financially, allowing it to grow very massively. It's referred to often as the Big Bang. Um, and I think in some ways, this is what we're hoping to see Liz Trust do if she gets in. So if she'll be able to um, do things like deregulate. Right now, we've got ourselves into a horrible sort of cycle of um, borrow, spend, and then tax. And this is just going on and on. And we need to stop that in its tracks. And if we can deregulate, so do much more small state, um, low taxes so that we can see this bigger growth, we will be able to see hopefully this sort of similar boom that um, we that was seen in the 1980s. Yeah. 
Lettuce Bromowski joining us. We're going to take one more quick break. Those are the two leaders. What about everybody else that ran? Because that's still the conservative party is the next next leader after whoever wins this race in that group somewhere. Talk about the future of the conservative party. The also rans, what that tells us about the state of the party. More with our friend Les over in the UK right after this as her tale continues. Welcome back to Herd Tell. Thrilled to be talking to our good friend, Lettuce Baronski. We've been wanting to get her on for a while. Now we got her and we get to go deep on the UK uh, conservative elections over there. Okay, let's talk about the also rant. I think the one that surprised everybody about this race was the strength of Penny Morden. Um, obviously, you know, again, we're all adults here. We know these things don't happen overnight. She's obviously done a lot of groundwork within the MPs of the party to get that much support. She planned this out. Do you think this is her rising in importance or was this a one-off? How do we kind of view her? She came in third, came in a close third, really. Uh, Mm. Where do we view her going forward? Do you think she's a power player now or is this a one-off thing? She's definitely a power player now. She's proved that she can corral people, get MPs on side, win that support. Um, And she did incredibly well to get where she's come from. She was put in for a very brief time as Defence Secretary by Boris before she was demoted once again um, and replaced in the reshuffle. Um, But she did, considering that's sort of been her biggest exposure, other than that, she's mainly been just a trade minister, so nothing particularly high level. She's done incredibly well to showcase the side of herself that says, I can get things done. She's got a very extensive background in um, um, in the military. She was in the Navy for a long time. I have no doubt that she will be back again uh, when there's a next leadership election, if there comes. And I also have no doubt that she will now hold a much higher position within the cabinet. Is there going to have to be some kind of detente here between the Penny camp and the Liz camp to combine? Is there a feeling like, okay, we're going to have to come together here if we're going to beat Rishi? Is there going to be some, I don't know how y'all do it over there, but you know, in, in our political party, there'd be, all right, I'm going to give you this and this, and you're going to support me on this and this, and we're going to go win this thing. Is there some of that going on now? That throughout the whole leadership, whenever the leadership contest, sorry, whenever a candidate went out, they had a sort of set number of voters behind them, essentially. Um, and it's always interesting to see. So Penny herself in the last election where she got kicked out, got 105 voters. And we remember Liz only got 113. So it really, really was very close. Um, it will be interesting to see who Penny now backs. Obviously, all MPs have their own mind and they'll make up their own mind about who they want to go to. Um, So a lot of it will be down to Liz, Truss and Rishi to do the legwork to try and win over each of Penny's followers. But if Penny decides to back Liz or Penny decides to back Rishi, that will definitely have an impact on where those people who were supporting Penny will go. While we're talking about um, the female candidates here, there were two other ones. This was a diverse field. It was four and four. Um, mm. Suella Braverman and Kimmy Bandanak. Um, Kimmy really opened a lot of people's eyes because a lot of people just didn't have any idea who she was. They'd probably never heard her speak. They probably hadn't seen her. They couldn't put a face to the name. She um, wasn't particularly noted before this. I think a lot of people mm. paid attention to her now, good, bad, and indifferent. And of course, Suella Braverman, she was one of those that called for resignation. She's a serving attorney general. Uh, Just break down those two women for us real quick. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, Suella Braverman, she was, I mean, she was, like you say, excuse me, and as I say, rather unheard of, particularly if you're not into politics massively, or if you, you know, aren't reading up about who the attorney general is at the time, which most people wouldn't be, but she came out and she came out swinging. What she is known for very much is she um, allowed 
changes to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is a very big and rather complicated thing that's going on here in the UK about the border between the UK once they left Brexit and the Republic of Ireland. So it would be Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, whether it be a hard border there, a soft border. Um, and very recently, the one of the main things that she's done is she um, pushed it through to say that we would not be breaking international law if we changed um, this Northern Ireland Protocol. And that was very, very popular within the Conservative Party. And I think that definitely gave her a bit of a push forward. Um, and then as we move on to Kemi, Kemi's done incredibly well. I think all the women actually in this Conservative leadership have done so well. And hopefully it will show a lot more of a female, um, many more female MPs higher up up really um but kemi she's very hard on woke which is very popular with our conservative um the conservative uh, party members as well as the mps and she's sort of not afraid to say what she thinks on that she's also very much a sort of true root blue conservative if that makes sense so she's very much on uh, less taxes and small state and all of that but she spoke her mind and she spoke it very well. And I think we can definitely expect to be seeing them again in much more seen and notable positions. And I expect they will try again to be leaders someday. Yeah. Interesting diversity in the conservative leadership. To One quick name before we put a bow on this thing. Uh, Tom Tuggenhat. Uh, people really didn't know who he was. I know he first came yeah. around when he gave that speech in the House of Commons. And wanted something, I never thought I'd live to see the United States being denounced in the house of commons but there i was sitting watching it live not for no good reason i must admit that speech he gave on afghanistan he was kind of seen as maybe the integrity candidate here um in a lot mm. of ways he wasn't going to win but i think a lot of people felt very comfortable with him see him as a good man uh what's his yeah. future in the party he, he's pretty secure as an mp does he go for a ministry post is he content on a back bench what do you think he does from here because he's got a lot of public support and respect in the chamber does he really want to get into the dirty into politics or do you think he just kind of maintains well i imagine that all mps somewhere in their in their political career will be aspiring to be in one of those top senior positions so i imagine he definitely will be going for it as you say he's sort of um well in my mind anyway at least he'd never really had a chance to be leader but was more trying to showcase himself for what he had to offer and his advantages. His background is almost entirely only in defence and in military, uh, which made him sort of limited and definitely not a, a prime minister position. But it gave him the opportunity to say that I'm here, I'm willing to sort of fight, I'm willing to showcase particularly things going on in Ukraine, things that happened in Afghanistan. And that will put him front of mind perhaps when it comes to choosing who will be in the next cabinet and who will hold those top positions which i think is the main thing that he really wanted to get out of this yeah i think so too and that that speech if anybody we covered it when he did it uh, i think we carried it go back and watch it it's really an exceptional piece of uh, oration in a chamber mm. that's rather famous for really good oration down through the years that that'll hold up against anybody's all right got to put you on the spot we've been talking about it for a half hour who's going to win this thing <laughs> I mean, my vote is definitely with Liz Truss. I'm a sort of libertarian values through and through. So tax cuts for me is the important thing. I think we've got to be big. We've got to be bold. We don't just want to keep going in this horrible cycle of borrow, spend tax. So Liz Truss is the one for me. Having said that, put your analysis hat back on. Now you got to go back to being impartial, though. Um, again, we opened up with it. Let's close with it. The narrative is... Rishi was more popular with the MPs. Liz is going to be more popular when it goes to the wider party. I think it's 170,000 some odd will be voting on this. Mm -hmm. If, if, how does he change? Because he, look, he's very smart. He's got a team. They plan for this. They hear all that. They've probably seen that polling data by now. What's their plan to move that number over the next six weeks? I think that they will have to really what the main plan is, is how they're going to enact all the things that they want to enact. So one thing we do here is they're basically going to be touring the UK, um, going around and having these things called hustings, which are with um, Conservative Party members where they'll be able to debate their policies um, and basically answer any questions from the audience that they may have. That will be so important as to whether Rishi, although he's not being true conservative right now, perhaps, will be able to showcase why 
his may be the best route forward. Um, and hopefully there won't be too many blue on blue attacks that we're seeing. And hopefully it will just go off the policies and what you believe. Um, but I guess we'll have to wait and see how these next few weeks pan out. All right. This is an unfair question, but it's a real world question. So I have to ask it. Which one has hurt the conservative party more lately as far as the future goes? Is it the Boris Johnson stuff? Or is it the infighting that has come through this process? Uh, it's probably not uh, separable because the, the one led to the other. Yeah. But which one of those do you think is the bigger issue going forward? I think that um, ultimately Boris's time was done. Six out of 10 of the membership thought that he should resign. And to be honest, I, I thought at that point that it was his time to go. It was damaging I think more than just the party when it was Boris's scandals, it was damaging our democracy and our whole government. It was sort of bringing it down with these sort of petty, immoral scandals. Now there is infighting, but if they can continue to showcase that they will unite at the end, and at the end of the day, conservative is conservative, they will support each other, back each other, and we don't get too many sort of uh, allegations or smear campaigns then we'll be fine. I mean, we want good debate between these leaders. We just don't want personal attacks. Yeah. Let us Bromofsky, she is fantastic. We're going to have you back in a couple of weeks as we get towards the end of this. We'll recap this again. We're not going to wait two years again. We'd love I promise that. You. Yeah, I would we'll, love uh, that. We'll get you in the regular rotation. Until we see you again on Herd Tell, though, let folks know where they can follow you and keep track of you and keep up with what you're doing. Yes, please. You can go follow me on Twitter at L Bromosky, which is uh, B-R-O-M-O-V-S-K-Y. Um, but that's my main place. And obviously on Young Voices. Yep, it's right there. If you're watching on the YouTube or the Big Talker, our radio partners, Facebook feed, it's right there in the lower corner graphic. Make sure you're following her outstanding stuff. Looking forward to doing it again. Going to be an interesting, hot couple of weeks, not just because of the record-setting <laughs> weather y'all got going on over there. Let us Bromofsky, thank you so much, ma'am. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. I uh, love this story. J.J. Watt, in case you didn't know, is an amazing human being on top of being an exceptional football player. He has had a lot of these viral stories over charity. He had another one, uh, K-H-O-U-11 in Houston. A Houston, Texas fan had tweeted out that she was selling some of her shoes, J.J. Watt signature shoes and a J.J. Watt jersey to try to raise money to pay for a funeral for her grandfather. Uh, this went viral. There were a lot of people online saying, I'll I'll give you the money, I'll pay for this, but keep the merchandise, this sort of thing. And it went to the next level when J.J. Watt himself replied to it and said, don't sell your stuff. We'll take care of the funeral. We're very sorry for your loss. And he did. Uh, K-H-O-U Houston followed up. Uh, the woman involved, it wasn't very long after that tweet, her phone, she got in contact with J.J. Watt and he PayPal'd her money directly because he's famous, but hundreds of people have also helped us who wanted to help too. These people don't know us or our story, said Simpson. That's the lady involved. They don't know what we've been through. It reminds me that there's good people in the world. Indeed, there is. Make sure you're one of them. Check out your friends and family. Make sure they're good. And once they're squared away, check on your community, your friends, your neighbors, and outwardly help out anybody you can wherever you can. Make you feel good. Plus, it always pays forward, and then they can go and help somebody else. Make the world a little better one place at a time, one person at a time. It's better than just mad rage clicking on social media. You'll feel better about yourself. That'll do it for Herd Tell for today. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us. You want to reach out? We'd love to hear from you. We really enjoy interacting with the audience. Uh, that's you. Uh, this is a partnership. If you're not there, we don't have anybody to talk to. And we've actually done whole segments, whole shows. We even had some of our listeners on to fight their corners when they didn't agree with something we said. We'd love to hear it at her tell show on gmail.com at her tell show on the Twitter. Of course, our guest and my social media is always on the lower third graphics. Make sure you're subscribing to the YouTube channel. Brand new playlist just put together. Best of her tells that we're working on. Also remixing some of the original 
early herd tail podcast and getting them in video form, getting them cleaned up a little bit um, so that you can enjoy those. If you missed any of them the first time, make sure you're subscribing to the YouTube page, wherever you're listening, wherever you and yours are across the street and around the world. We hope you're well. We hope you are well fed. Talk to you tomorrow for more herd tail. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. Somos la magia.